welcome back faithful politics listeners and viewers if you're watching us on our youtube channel i am your political host will wright and i'm joined by your faithful host and my friend pastor josh bertram how's it going josh doing great thanks will and this week we have a uh i don't know a gift a surprise a uh we are blessing you with two amazing young men um <laughs> who work at word and way and i'm not going to do justice by giving the introduction so i'm gonna let them give their own introduction so first coming from missouri uh we have brian kaler so welcome to the show brian or welcome back to the show and uh yeah tell us a little bit about yourself yeah thanks for having me back i, I think this is my third uh hit on my punch card so i'm not sure Indeed. when i get a free episode but uh <laughs> <laughs> It's great to be back with you, and Word and Way is a publication that's been around since 1896. We started in Kansas City, Missouri. We're now based in Jefferson City, although virtual office these days, staff are everywhere. Uh, started out as an independent Baptist publication, and we are still independent and much more ecumenical in looking at news and events from a Christian perspective. And that often means in this wild world that we are in that we're looking at topics like Christian nationalism and a lot of the things that you're exploring and how Christians can confront and push back for a more authentic version of the gospel. <laughs> and as for me, I'm, I'm Brian Kaler. I'm a Baptist minister with a PhD in political communication, and I have been leading Word and Way since the end of 2016. It's amazing. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Bo, what's happening? Yeah, I just appreciate you all still calling us young. That's a, a <laughs> word that's incredibly, you, you know, becoming more and more not applied to me these days. Um, so I am a mainline Protestant pastor in Indianapolis now uh, since we last talked, but I still get to uh, have the privilege of writing about religion and politics and culture with Brian at uh, Word and White on our Substack, A Public Witness. Um, and in addition to doing all those things, I'm also pursuing a Ph.D. in public affairs. Really, really cool. Um, well, you folks have just written a a book, and um, I mean one of many. But you 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 both are very very prolific writers, and I love writing or reading her stuff. But you wrote a book um, called Baptizing America, and before before we unpack like what it's all about, why you wrote it. I just got to say, it's a phenomenal book. Um, the the pre-read you, you provided to us, Absolutely. You know, it's, it's one of those things like when when you read books about Christian nationalism, and in, and to your point, Brian, it is a topic that we explore uh, pretty regularly on our on our show. Uh, when you read a book about Christian nationalism, I, I'll be honest, I go into that book thinking that I've kind of heard it all before. Um, <laughs> and like, and mind you, like, I'm not an expert, but like, I just, I've read a ton of books about it. And, and I was surprised to learn a whole bunch of new stuff about Christian national Christian nationalism, the history of it, um, kind of the evolution and, and sort of the different ways that we see it in our society. Um, and, and I just can't, I can't give enough praise, uh, for, for the book. So well, well done, um, to you Thanks. both. Um, but, but, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about like what is baptizing America about and like why did you write it and I'll 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 let you answer it first Ryan and you can fill it in uh, both if you got anything to say. Yeah, well thanks first of all for reading it and and for your your, your kind words there. And I think I, I, what you said is exactly why we wrote the book is because we have read a lot about Christian nationalism. We have listened to a lot of podcasts about Christian nationalism. We have watched a lot of Christian nationalism and gone to Christian nationalism events. And there's been a missing part of the story, despite all of the conversation about Christian nationalism. And that is particularly the role that mainline Protestants played and continue to play in upholding this ideology. And so we felt like that story needed to be told for a couple of key reasons. I mean, one, we need to know how we got here. If we don't truly appreciate and understand how we got to a place where Christian nationalism is the threat to democracy and Christianity that it is today then we're not going to necessarily come up with the correct solutions on how we start to detox from Christian nationalism. And then a second reason of that is, is, is it's easy if you're in one of the traditions, a mainline Protestant tradition, to point at those conservative evangelicals over there and be like, well, they have a problem with Christian nationalism. They need to get their house in order. And that's that, that can feel good. And it's true. All of that's true. And, and post-January 6th, conservative evangelicals deserve pretty much all the criticism we can give about Christian nationalism. However, in addition to looking at the, maybe it's not necessarily a, spe a speck, maybe it is a plank in the other's eye, 
we also need to look at the plank in our own eyes as well. And so this is a call to the other half, if you will, of the Protestant Christian family to say, well, where have we promoted Christian nationalism? Where have we wrongly fused our American and Christian identities and pretended that they were equivalent, that they were in unison? And how can we begin to remove that ideology from our own churches and our own denominations? And I think the only thing I'd add uh, to what Brian said, I think everything he said is spot on here, is we were, we were surprised that the story hadn't been told before. Because as we were mm -hmm. watching Christian nationalism, as we were hearing some of the various uh, data points cited by some of the leading sort of purveyors of Christian nationalism, we kept thinking like, well, that has roots in mainline Protestantism. The mainline Protestants helped make that happen. So whether it's under God, the Pledge of Allegiance, and God we trust is the national motto, a lot of these things that these Christian nationalists cite is, well, America has always been a Christian nation. The mainline Protestants helped make happen. And so we have been talking about this for a few years. You know, this this part of the story really needs to be told. And finally, we said, well, if nobody else is going to do it, let, let's let's take an attempt. So we wrote a, a long essay of, of I think it was like 1,600 words for religion and politics, uh, which is a publication of the Danforth Center at Washington University. And we just kind of set up a trial balloon, and we thought, well, somebody will shoot this down, right? A, a Christian nationalism scholar, a historian, somebody will say, well, you all don't understand this correctly. You don't have it right because those aren't our specialties. But it went up, and we got all these great – I mean we had denom mainline denominational faith leaders reaching out to us. We had Christian nationalism scholars saying this is spot on. This needs to be told. And we really got a lot of encouragement to really take that essay and do more with it, and that more is this book that's coming out from Chalice Press. Well, that's awesome. I, I, I really enjoyed uh, the book. And one of the questions I have to kind of set the stage even further for our conversation is you talk about a January 6th um, that was actually not the January 6th that all of us think about. Can you kind of set the stage for this kind of remembrance, uh, this, this event that took place to remember what happened on January 6th and where you saw these the uh, Christian nationalism displayed in ways that might be different than some of us some of us think about it currently yeah I appreciate that that question Josh because we start the book there because it is just is that moment of trying to uh, to shake up the story here a little bit uh, it's a January 6th the steps of the US Capitol there's a preacher who is praying for America to be one nation under God during an event that was created by the Speaker of the House. A bunch of members of Congress are there. They're singing a couple of Christian hymns. It's, it, it's Christian nationalism. And, but this is January 6, 2022. This is the one-year anniversary, and this was an event led by then-Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, it is mostly attended, almost predominantly, by Democratic members of Congress. Uh, they're they're singing hymns that are in uh, you know Christian hymns that are in a lot of your hymnals in your churches. And the preacher who prays that this would be one nation under God is Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Which, when we think of the Episcopal Church, we generally think of like the bastion of liberal Protestantism today. And Bishop Curry has been an excellent voice against Christian nationalism in a lot of ways. But in this particular moment, we see the enactment of Christian nationalism. Sure, it's a kinder, friendlier, less violent version than we saw on that exact same spot, on those exact same stairs, you know, 365 days earlier. But it's still Christian nationalism. Yeah, you, you know, you know, I, I was I was wondering if and, and and Bo, maybe maybe you can answer this. So, all three of you are pastors, have are very you know fluent in theology, Christianese, all that other kind of stuff. I'm not like I'm, I came to the faith in 2008. I'm still learning, you know, um, and some of the things I'm learning are like, like Third Day is not like a new Christian band, <laughs> like. <laughs> like, like these are things I'm still learning and just That's developing funny. my own faith. You know, I'm listening to some like Christian worship music and I'm telling my wife, my wife's a pastor's kid, you know, it's like, oh man, these guys are pretty good. You know, have you heard of these guys third day? I think, you know, 
<laughs> and, and he's looking at me like, um, yeah, I've heard of them, <laughs> you know, but, but like, like there's a term that comes up quite a bit in the book, mainline Protestant. And, uh, for a person like me, that word doesn't probably have the same weight or carry the same weight as it may for you all. So can you like break down, like, what does it mean yeah. to be a mainline Protestant? Absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate that. And sometime you and I will have to jam out to Sonic Flood. Um, but uh, yes, is that a new band, like a techno band <laughs> or something? <laughs> so with within American Christianity broadly, you kind of have three dominant um, sort of, you know, lanes. You've got American Catholicism, American Evangelicalism and main, American mainline Protestantism. Now, there's others that don't fit neatly in any of those categories, but broadly, those are the three big groups. And basically, you know, up until the mid to late 20th century, the mainland Protestants were more dominant than the evangelicals were, and, and then we've kind of had a reverse of, of fortunes here. So mainland Protestants um, can be looked at a few different ways. One is to just go by denominations, right, to measure them by belonging. If you belong to what are called the Seven Sisters of the Mainline, which are the denominations of the American Baptists, the Episcopalians, the United Methodist, the UCC, the Presbyterian USA, the Disciples of Christ, and the ELCA Lutherans. If you're one of a member of those seven denominations, you're a mainline Protestant by sort of category. Um, and I think there's some value in that, but in, within those denominations, there's also a lot of diversity of theological thought and political thought, so it's not like you can paint a broad brush and say those, everybody in those seven denominations is the same. But there's actually a scholar named David Hollinger who's written a recent book where he talks about mainline Protestants as being those who are more ecumenically minded, or he calls them ecumenical Christians. So basically, if you're really wanting to sort of work across uh, Christian boundaries and sort of work for the unity of the church, if you're really open to this idea that, like, you know, we can partner over there if we don't really believe the same thing as each other, you tend to be, have more of a mainline Protestant ethos, whereas a lot of evangelical and fundamentalist corners, certainly not all of them, have been much more, we're going to keep to ourselves, we're going to do things our ways, we're more suspicious of sort of inter-Christian collaboration than perhaps the the mainline Protestants are. So you can belong to a particular denomination. You can be more open-minded open about ecumenic, ecumenism. Um, those are a few ways of thinking about mainline Protestants. One of the other sort of historical divides has been kind of the um, willingness to incorporate modern and modernist thinking into religious life. And obviously you've, that goes all the way back to some of the teachings around evolution and some of the, the early fights there. So it's not an easy category to define. Um, we tend to take the first two in the book. We either talk about these different denominations, and then we also talk about how they tend to have this sort of ethos of being more ecumenical in their approach. Got it. So, so Brian is is like is mainline Protestant Protestant. How do you say that word? Protestantism. Did I say that right? Yeah, you got it. Uh, nailed it. All right. So, like, is 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 the mainline part just something that is sort of like mutually agreed upon by scholars that this is mainline, or is there sort of like an equation, like you know, A plus B equals mainline? Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at some of the, the scholarships that's happening today, and I, I think we cite both of these definitions, PRI and Pew. When they're doing research to see, you know, what type of people, you know, think about what type of things, uh, they actually have created their own denominational lists, and so they they do the belonging definition, and they include the seven sisters. They also include others, so they have defined every denomination in Orthodox, Catholic, mainline, or or evangelical, and and it's really interesting. You can see that the mainline evangelical split runs through faith traditions. Right, so the largest Presbyterian denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, is mainline, but the next largest is evangelical. And same with Lutherans. And then this is where the terms can be fuzzy. So the mainline Lutheran group is the evangelical Lutheran Church in America, but then the evangelical one is the Missouri Synod, right? And so the terms, you know, words evolve. And so yeah. the, the, it, it, that shows us how this can sometimes be complicated. And then, you know, with, with, with Baptists, it's, it, it's flipped there. The larger group, the Southern Baptists, are evangelical. And then you have a smaller group, American Baptists, have been the historical mainline, although other groups today are also like Cooperative Baptist Fellowship are considered mainline. And then you've got, you know, Midnight Church USA. There's a lot of different denominations. And, and as Bo noted, we were a mainline Protestant nation 
for most of our history until the late 60s, early 70s, when we start to see this shift happening. And it's really only as the main line is losing its influence that the term main line actually comes into play. But now it's a dominant term, ironically, when they're not really the main line any longer. Uh, although some of the more recent work by PRRI has shown that evangelicals are now the ones in decline. So the two groups are actually coming back to be about the same size. Hmm. That makes sense. So, so I love the the book in tracing some of the history, moving to how we got here today, and essentially how the main line denominations, being a majority of the people uh, identifying in the United States um, at certain times, um, what what have the shifts been, and how? Like, how did they set the groundwork for what we're seeing today? What are kind of the major, maybe the major events or shifts that we saw historically that have set the groundwork for someone like Donald Trump or, or like the Seven Mountain Mandate, um, NAR uh, ideas, New Apostolic Reformation? What, how did the mainline den uh, denominations set the groundwork for this? that you kind of explore in the book. Well, let me sort of speak to the first half of that, Josh, and I'll let Brian speak to the second half of that. So I'll give him the easy part and I'll take the hard part. Um, I think it's important to note historically that the mainliners have always been more of the sort of cultural uh, elites. So the mainline church, even when it hasn't been the dominant tradition in American Christianity, has always had an outsized influence on our culture and our, our sort of social institutions. Um, some of that has to do with correlations to education and, and, and financial resources. Some of that has to do with just history of, you know, the Episcopalians were here pretty early, right? And evangelicalism was a tradition that grew up over time in, in, in American society. So we should just note that, like, the, the mainliners have always had this kind of hold on our culture, and they sort of saw the what was good for their church and what was good for our country's culture as sort of being um, – going well together. There wasn't a lot of tension between the two. They were kind of symbiotic. And it was only when you saw this rise of American evangelicalism and all of a sudden the mainlanders' place in as the sort of cultural elites were being challenged that there became they became more aware of this tension. So I think a lot of what we cite in the book is some sense inadvertent, or at least the mainlanders were unaware of what they were doing because they just didn't see this tension and this friction that exists between church and state in the way that obviously as we're growing uh, in our awareness of Christian nationalism, we clearly now see this is not healthy. I don't want to excuse it. I just want to say they were just kind of oblivious to it in some ways. And I think a lot of the incidents we talk about um, demonstrates that. So, for instance, the con the constituting convention of the National Council of Churches, right, the dominant uh, mainline uh, parachurch organization, not only mainline, but they're certainly in leadership of that. When it was called together in 1950 to form, their theme was this nation under God. Right, And if you were to have sort of a, a group of Trumpian Christians today gather for a convention and this nation under God was their theme, we would all be screaming about it, and rightfully so. Right. But if we're going to scream about it today in 2024, we should be able to look back to 1950 and say, oh, that wasn't as, um, as acceptable as maybe perhaps they thought it was at the time. Yeah, and that's one of the things we highlight in the book is that our definition of Christian nationalism can't just be Christians engaged in politics that you disagree with. And so it is that idea of, 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 of treating the same types of responses and the same types of engagement equally in, in the use of the term. As far as the, the question about, you know, how does this help set the stage for Donald Trump? I mean, the, one of the things I would note is that Donald Trump was discipled himself in the mainline tradition. So I know today we think about Trump as the, you know, the president for evangelicals, but he was confirmed in a Presbyterian church. He grew up in uh, another mainline church in the Reformed tradition that was led by uh, Vincent Norman Peale, a Presbyterian minister. And so he's, he is a product of uh, not only mainline Protestant America, but even specifically of mainline Protestant congregations. And so this is just one example, I think, of how for generations, mainline Protestants were discipling Americans that we could merge Americanism and Christianity. We could see them as one and the same and that we, there wasn't any conflict or contradiction there and that to be a good American was to be a Christian. And so 
decades and decades of discipling people and teaching this. And then as they started to lose some influence, evangelicals popped up and said, yeah, we like all of that. Let's do it. And now some mainline Protestants are like, well, no, maybe this isn't so good anymore. But I mean, I think part of the issue is that the demographics of our nation have changed. And so it didn't feel as dangerous for most of America in the 1950s and 1960s because most of America identified as Christian. You know, when you only have a couple of percent that are, you know, that are atheist and you only have a couple of other percent that are Jewish and a couple of other percent of any other religion, and you're a nation that's 90% or more Christian, then to talk about Christianity and being a Christian nation, it excludes some people. It's still problematic, but it doesn't exclude as many as it does today. And so one of the things that we, we know is that one of the reasons why Christian nationalism is more dangerous today is because it doesn't work as well in our more pluralistic society. It is more of a threat to democracy than it was 50 or 60 years ago when most people were Christian. That, that, that makes sense. And, you know, I, I, I noted in um, the email that I sent you all that I, I thought that the, your book was up there with like one nation under God by Kevin Cruz, because like, you know, like if, if, if folks haven't read, read that book I, or listened to it, how I'm doing it, like I would highly encourage you to do it. Cause it really sort of gives like the full kind of like evolution. Um, and as you were talking about like one nation under God and God, we trust, like there's a whole like chapter about like, like stamps, you know, <laughs> and, like, and like money and, and, and how all that stuff kind of, kind of came to be. And, and it, and it's almost like your book is like, I don't know, like a concordance to, to one nation under God or some sort of like cliff notes, you know, uh, that kind of helps sort of like unpack some of the elements of it. Um, but, but I want to, I want to go back to, to your, your, your comment about Trump and, and the, um, and his pastor uh, growing up. Uh, because this this I found very very interesting about his connection to prayer in public schools. So uh, can uh, I don't know who'd be best to answer it. Um, I'll, I'll I'll point to you, Bo, because you're you're closer to my left eyeball. Um, so if you can kind of uh, unpack that, what, what's the significance there? And I'm actually going to pass this to to Brian. One of the fun things about co-authoring yeah. a book is we each take different chapters, and the way we write is we each took primary responsibility for one chapter, then workshopped it with the other. But Brian was the one who uh, provided this in the book, and I I want to give him the credit and the chance to speak to it here. Oh, that's very nice, very sweet. <laughs> Go ahead. He, he's saying he's being nice and giving me credit, but he just doesn't remember it. Um, that's why they're really they're, he's punting. I feel you. So, you know, one of the Makes key sense. markers of identifying and defining Christian nationalism today is support for government official prayers in public schools. We're not talking about the, the times of silence uh, because, uh, you know, as long as there's math tests, there will always be prayer in school. But we're talking about the like teacher or, you know, authoritative figure led prayer that can be, you know, coercive in, in public schools. And uh, so, Whitehead and Perry, they actually have this as one of their, their six variables when they're like trying to find where people line up on a continuum of Christian nationalism. One of the questions is, you know, do you think prayer should be brought back into public schools? And so if it's, if it's Christian nationalism today to say that, that prayer should be in public schools, it was definitely Christian nationalism to put it there in the first place. And so I went back and looked at the prayer that in, in New York that led to the Supreme Court decision that's often called, you know, when we kick God out of schools, right? But the, the, there was a, a, and that decision was in 1962, but the prayer was actually written and put into public schools in New York in 1951. And the state board of, of regents there for education had brought together some clergy trying to write a prayer that would be ecumenical. So that way it wouldn't be taking sides with this denomination over that denomination. And then when they release the prayer, which is a pretty, you know, innocuous prayer, as long as you're a Christian, um, then they, they had a, a bunch of pastors in the state immediately came out and praised it. And Norman Vincent Peale, uh, who would be Trump's pastor, uh, officiated the first of his weddings. Uh, you know, has a, a big wait, influence. Wait, Donald on Trump a... has been married more than one time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wait, this is breaking news. <laughs> and I think the first two were in the church, but I think Peel had died before the second wedding. Um, but uh, but he only officiated the first one, and so but he he's one of the ones who who quickly praises in public this new prayer 
to put in public schools. He said, every patriotic and thoughtful citizen of all faiths should enthusiastically endorse the proposal. This country cannot endure if we cannot at least mention God in schools. I mean, that that is a, a, a textbook example of Christian nationalism today. If you come out, you know, if Franklin Graham, which we use as an example in that section, comes out and says something very similar to that today, it's Christian nationalism. And so here we have a significant figure. Uh, he he w was a Methodist minister. He's leading a historic reform church in America congregation. The very next year, he would have his best-selling book, The Power of Positive Thinking. He later served as a vice president for the National Council of Churches, right? He's a significant figure in mainline Protestant world, and he's endorsing this, as did numerous other mainline Protestants. And in fact, in the public record and the news accounts in New York at the time, I couldn't find, you know, Protestant pastors arguing or, or Christian pastors arguing against the use of the prayer. There would occasionally be a rabbi who would suggest that it was unnecessary, which was cuts against Peel's own argument that people of all faiths could say this prayer. Uh, but it was the, it was the mainline Protestants who helped put this prayer in public schools in the first place. That is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I love the way that your book is structured. I think it's structured really well and when you give the context for Christian nationalism in our in America and how it came about kind of helping us understand it, one of the things you talk about is um, civil religion or the idea of civil religion and how that was a very appealing idea. You alluded to it earlier because of the demographic changes that have happened, that that civil religion has, in a sense, become uncivil. And I, I love I love the play on words there. But could you help us understand what is civil religion and what role has it played in America and especially setting the groundwork for where we are today? Maybe. And the reason I say maybe is because one of the arguments we have in this chapter, and we actually think this is one of the more important chapters in the book, is that um, we are really critical of this concept of civil religion because we think it's been poorly defined and poorly understood, and that the more you sort of pull at it, the more it falls apart pretty quickly. So traditionally, mm -hmm. uh, civil religion comes out of the work of Robert Bella. It's been sort of studied and discussed in a lot of different sociological and other circles. But it's basically this idea that there is this sort of form of transcendent meaning that exists within a culture, and that it's something that isn't religious but kind of has quasi-religious elements, so maybe you could call it religious, um, but is maybe not tied to sort of any one particular deity or one, one set of – one creed, but yet it has these sort of unspoken national marks that everybody sort of is on board with except when they're not. Um, and as you can see, like this falls apart pretty quickly, but it's been seen as kind of innocuous, right? So think of like a Memorial Day observance, right? That's clearly a, a time of civil religion where we're assigning transcendent meaning to what's happening in that moment. It's not just a remembrance of those who have passed away, but we're assigning a certain kind of value to those sacrifices that transcends uh, the, the functions of the military, so to speak. And what we're really trying to say is that this has become the gateway into Christian nationalism, right? That rather than say civil religion is okay, but Christian nationalism is bad, that that line is not nearly as clear, and so much of what we have passed off as civil religion quickly bleeds into uh, Christian nationalism. My favorite example of this, and, and or least favorite example of this, is Boy Scout Sunday, right? So in my churches I've been part of in the past, maybe some of your churches, there's a Sunday in February where the Boy Scouts, right, for God and country, right, sort of the dominant sort of, you know, very civil religion type thing that I would argue is very Christian nationalistic. They come to the sanctuary, they bring in the flag, they say the Pledge of Allegiance um, as part of the worship service. Now, it's meant to celebrate Scouts and their dedication to their country, their dedication to service, and the dedication to their faith. But what's really going on there? Why are we saying the Pledge of Allegiance to a particular country in a sanctuary that's supposed to be an embassy of the kingdom of heaven? When you start to pull at it, it's not innocuous at all. And yet, so many mainline churches promote Boy Scout Sunday. Indeed, the Scouts have come under attack by some evangelical circles, right, because they're not they're, – because they're being more inclusive on LGBTQ stuff. And so there's been a, a real um, synergy between mainline Protestantism and scouting that is really indicative of this kind of civil religion that we actually think is much more Christian nationalistic than we want to admit and is actually quite harmful to both the church and to the country. No, oh, that, that's really interesting. You know, I'm – one of the things I think I struggle with when it comes to Christian nationalism is like, like, are we, 
um, just, I don't know, a bunch of like woke, you know, spiritual people that are, that are, you know, tuning our eyes towards this thing that, that has sort of been there, but nobody's really kind of raised the flag to kind of say anything about it, you know, until, you know, after January 6th, cause we were like, Oh, we see Christian flags. We see like, you know, the pine tree, we see all this other stuff. And, and, and we're like, wow, maybe there is really a, a big issue. Like, be, 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 because a lot of this, like, I, I sometimes feel it's like <clears throat> the way we view racism, right? Um, like today in 2024, like, like in the, in the sort of world of, you know, movies that are being remade, I don't think they'll make Blazing Saddles. I don't think they would remake Tropic Thunder, you know, and I definitely don't think Jimmy Kimmel will go on dressed like Carl Malone. You know, like, like, cause we've just changed, right? Our culture has changed. So, so like, like, can you, can you maybe make an argument for why, like our attention to Christian nationalism is so important, um, you know, given sort of the context of what your book covers in the past? Yeah. I'm happy to take a first stab and then Brian, if you, if you think I'm missing something here, uh, well, I think you're right that there's been some of this that has always been there that we haven't attended to well. And I do think, as Brian noted earlier, as our culture has become much less homogenous, that that has been – it's been more important to understand the sort of effects of this and the problems of this. However, our understanding of the present also illuminates our past. It makes us realize that we've frankly tolerated a lot we probably shouldn't have tolerated in the past because it was problematic and we just didn't see it because we were ignorant. So I do think in the sense that we're seeing it now, it doesn't mean – you know, all of a sudden it just appeared. It just means we weren't as aware of in the past that we should have been. Just like we weren't, we, we, we know, we knew some, a lot of the, we knew racism has been part of American history from the beginning, yet we're, we're becoming more and more aware of that now than we used to be, right? And I think we're the better for it. Um, at the same time, I do think that sociologists have studied this, right? I mean, this, uh, Christian nationalism is not just some label we apply to people. And I do think that this is something that I think is a misunderstanding that's out there. You know, there is social scientific data that that sort of um, can measure Christian nationalism and can track how it changes over time. And I think as we're getting an understanding of what's going on with it, um, that's helping us understand where the problem is, what the problem amounts to, and how widespread and pervasive it can be. So I, I do think that it's, 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 it really is a concept that's rooted in social science. It's not just something, a label we're applying to people now. Yeah, I mean, the research is very clear, you know, from Benjamin Whitehead and Perry and, and Gorski and others, that when someone shows up high on the Christian nationalism continuum, that they really do espouse and believe in some of these key tenets of Christian nationalism, that they think about other issues similarly. So, you know, it really is, it's a worldview that it changes the way you think about violence, the way you think about guns, the way you think about immigrants, the way you think about a whole host of other issues. And that's when you know as in, in social science research that you've identified something really important. When, when it's connected to all of the, like if we can decide whether or not you're on you know, one end of the continuum or the other end of Christian nationalism, and then know that you're gonna think differently about all of these different issues, it shows that something core is at play here. And I do think, that, I mean, obviously there's been a lot more attention to Christian nationalism because of the January 6th insurrection. But the scholarship was already there before that. Christians Against Christian Nationalism, you've had Amanda Tyler on the program, was already <laughs> created uh, over a year and a half before January 6th insurrection. So it's, it's not a new idea or new concept, but we are, I think, even more aware and more concerned about the danger that it poses because we saw what happened in an attempt to overthrow a democracy and then as we you know, unpack some of this, we recognize the danger it, it poses in our churches and that it is, it is I mean, we, we clearly call it in the book, it's heretical. It, it, it subverts the gospel. It's not what Christianity is about. And so we need to quit putting up with it. Just because we put up with it, this, this heresy for, for generations doesn't mean we should just say, oh, well, it's just always been there. Like, let's do the hard work and separate the wheat and the chaff here. Yeah, it, it, it's so fascinating to me, this entire conversation and one one thing that I that I struggle with kind of in the same vein as as Will was talking about and, and let me just give some context so I was listening to a, a lecture on a course about why you know study history and essentially one of the things that the, the professor was saying was two things well there's several but two things stood out in these lectures one 
was that we don't learn from history. By and large, people don't learn from history. We're supposed to learn from history, but we don't. We want to experience it ourselves, unfortunately. And then the second thing is that um, freedom is not a universal is not a universal value. Power is, and if you look at the way that people have walked, like the idea that we can that everyone values freedom the same as we do is a very dangerous idea because it isn't true. And uh, people at different times value it in different ways and there's different kinds of freedom. I won't go into all that. But the reason that gives context is because I'm thinking about nationalism. And one of the one of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the subjects that the that was brought up is is the National Social Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, right in Germany and how nationalism became a uh, a substitute for religion. Right. It, it had the same kinds of worldview kind of uh, uh, values that shaped people's thinking. And when I look at this and I think about secularism. Right. And like I think about secularism as almost like a substitute religion as well. Like this sense that there's some kind of values, these ultimate values that are going to be put there. And then I start to wonder, are we just trying to is it just a competition between two things that uh, are, are just like trying to bring ultimate values? And then in that case, which one is more important and which one wins? One, one of the quotes that you have that I, that I found myself like agreeing with, and it was a quote like from someone where you weren't putting in there like, a, like as a positive thing was like, hey, these guys were not like chosen, right? Our nation, the, the founders weren't chosen in the sense that they were the champions, uh, God's champions, but they were, they were chosen because they, they inherited and espoused chosen principles. Uh, and and I've, I've had myself say, well, hey, you know, guys, I think that a nation, I don't believe that America is God's chosen nation in any sense, like that, but I do think that people that align themselves, nation that align themselves with Christian values or with biblical values or whatever you say, they can tend to be more, you know, potentially more in God's favor than the other. I find myself rethinking that these days. I find myself challenging my own thinking that I've had. But how how have you guys worked through this? Like, are we just deciding one set of principles versus another? Like atheistic principles versus Christian principles? Which ones really went out? Because it, it, it seems to me at the end of the day, like there are a set of values that people are going to choose and a nation is going to choose because we have moral under, underpinnings to what we do. How, how do we work through this? And I, you know, I'm this isn't like a, yeah, I don't know. This isn't like a trap yeah. question. It's really a curious question. How do we figure this out? Because like, I don't necessarily want to like take China's like China's values as a, as a government and a nation and say, oh yeah, that's that's good. I, I uh, does my question make sense? I know I'm kind of rambling yeah. here, but let, let me try to. I'd speak love to, to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So Josh, I think I, I hear what you're wrestling with, and I would say this: right, our writing and critique of Christian nationalism. Uh, comes from a desire f to make sure we're protecting the church um, from an idolatry and a heresy, and also wanting us yes. to believe that you know Christians do have a role in public life in in American democracy that can be healthy, right? So on the one hand, we don't want to idolize the nation because we don't think that anything but God deserves our worship. And when you Agreed. do make an idol out of the country, all of a sudden that's what you're worshiping, and you can't critique it, and you you end up placing your loyalty, yeah. your ultimate loyalty, where it doesn't belong, right? So the church should stand over all the countries. Christ is the Lord of all the nations, and um, we need the church to be the church. And the problem with Christian nationalism is it corrupts the church and damages the gospel in that way. On the flip side, right, we think that if you can keep the nation in an appropriate place, that obviously, you know— democracy is a good, right? And I would say that democracy is good for Christians because it allows the churches to operate as freely as they possibly can. And it also allows people to flourish as uh, God intends more so than any other, other government that I know. So I'm very pro-democracy. I'm very pro-American democracy. I want Christians to be robustly involved in public life defending democratic principles because I think that's good for humanity. I think that's – and I also think that's good for the church. So 
I view these as um, symbiotic in the sense of, of the church and democracy working together for ends that both can affirm. At the same time, what we worry about with Christian nationalism is it undermines democracy and it undermines the church. Josh, the key that I think you made a comment there was about the, the quest for power. I mean that, that. I mean that. It doesn't matter if we have a secular system in China yeah. or you know, the yeah. old Soviet model, or if you have a, a, a quote Christian nation, right? That that quest for power always ends up hurting the people. I mean, the the, the thing that's important to know about Christian nationalism is that it doesn't mean that we all, the four of us, right? It doesn't mean that we're necessarily in charge of the nation, because Christian nationalism even is, is really about a very slur, you know, narrow slice of Christianity who gets to be in charge. I mean, we see this in Russia is, is, is honestly the best contemporary example. It's a Christian nationalistic state. The Russian Orthodox mm. Church and the Russian government are, are essentially in one. The point that, that Patriarch Kirill, the Russian Orthodox Church, has even said that if, to the Russian soldiers that if they go and die in Ukraine, that it is a salvific act. Right? It will wash away their oh, sins. I mean, that's it's Christian nationalism, but it's not good yeah. for other Christians either. <laughs> the, I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses are the most persecuted group uh, religiously in Russia, but number two are Baptists and number mm. three are Pentecostals, even more than mm. Muslims. Hundreds of Baptists and Pentecostals are being arrested and fined and some even imprisoned every single year uh, since before the, the, the invasion two years ago in Ukraine and, and, and since. And so Christian nationalism is never actually even good for all Christians. It's only about a few of them. Mm. I mean, we saw this in the founding of our country. It's one of the reasons why we have a separation of church and state is, you know, my, my Baptist, you know, forefathers and foremothers and living out there in, you know, that, that, that godly state of Virginia uh, were, were being <laughs> thrown in prison right. <laughs> uh, for being Baptist and not Anglicans. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I hear you, Josh. We, 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 we're worried about Christian nationalism because I think it's both dangerous democratically. It's also dangerous to the church. But mm. there's also there are other regimes that could also be dangerous. And so we need a system that is not only one where there is a separation of church and state, but where there is also then religious freedom, religious liberty uh, as, as well. Yes. And that's that's the model that our country has been experimenting with for a little over 200 years, sometimes better than others. And so right. we're trying to keep us on that course. And I should just note, note that when we talk about it being a threat to democracy, right, back to what Brian was saying earlier, when we, when the social scientists look at Christian nationalism scales and what they're correlated with, a stronger support for Christian nationalism is correlated with like things like higher support for political violence, higher support for restrictions on voting, higher support or less tolerance of interracial marriages and other sort of, you know, um, racist and other types of discriminations towards LGBTQ people, etc. So we are seeing how if you are a Christian nationalist, you are unlikely to be – or you're, like, you're likely to be less supportive of other democratic principles such as equality, equal – you know, civil rights, that kind of a thing. So that's – when we talk about it being a threat to democracy, it's there in the social science data that, that there are these correlates. That's, that's, really, that's really interesting. You know, and um... – I, I have to push back on you a little bit, Brian, because Virginia is not a state, it's a commonwealth. Um, <laughs> I should know. I lived there for six years. I know better. <laughs> and uh, if, if you can't get that right, I don't know if anybody I should I meant state your... in the generic state term. The United States is a state. Russia is yes, a state. Yes, that, yes, that's what yes. I meant. You know, separation but, of church and state. <laughs> yeah, it's not separation of church and, and commonwealth, which would be a mouthful. <laughs> this but... doesn't ring off the tongue as well. So. <laughs> Building a wall between. <laughs> um, all right, so so I I'm, I am kind of curious about like, you know what what can we do about you know our entanglement with like nationalistic ideologies if you're a Christian and and maybe maybe kind of a, a part of that is like like. Like, are people subscribing to Christian nationalistic ideology without even really knowing? I mean, you know, like r recently, um, I've uh, Heidi something political reporter from MSNBC said on air, like, you know, Christian nationalists something believe their rights come from God, you know, and there was a whole like, you know, thing about, you know, this and that and how she gets it wrong. And, you know, the liberals hate God and blah, 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 you know, and like. And 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 th there seem to be a lot of different types of permutations of Christian nationalism that 
that some folks are just sort of blowing out of proportion and then some folks are getting it right. And when we talked to Sam Perry a couple weeks ago, like I, I, I said, hey, like if there's anybody that would that would know what the definition of Christian nationalism is, it, it would be you. Right. So like so I so I, like break this down for me. Like if I say God bless you after somebody sneezes, like am I a Christian nationalist? You know, <laughs> like, like, I don't think I am, <laughs> but I like to hear from you, you know. So 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 may, maybe kind of help us walk through, you know, um, what people are doing and may not know um, that are sort of like Christian nationalists adjacent and and um like how do we detangle like our faith from our nationalist I identity yeah so let me speak about this in the church um you know as a pastor what i'm concerned about is the health of my christian community and that means i want us to know what it means to be christian i want us to understand the life and teachings of jesus and live them out in the world and i want to make sure that we are protective of the integrity of our witness and we don't let it become compromised by things like nationalism and other things that corrupt it. So I think from – if you're looking – one of the things we're – reason for writing this book is we want to say to mainline Protestants, as Brian was talking about earlier, like let's look at the speck in our own eye or the log in our own eye and make sure that we're dealing with that. Because the bottom line is I'm a progressive mainline Protestant pastor. I can scream at the evangelicals and the fundamentalists that support Trump all I want. They don't care what I have to say. It might be cathartic for me. It might help me feel better, but it's not going to change anything. Where I do have influence is in my mainline Protestant congregation, my mainline Protestant denomination, and the people who I who, who respect what, where I'm coming from, and they will listen to me, and they're the ones I need to think about who I'm talking to. So we see a lot, you know, a lot of pastors um, get in trouble over the flag in the sanctuary, right? This kind of is the most common symbol. You know, that flag is sitting there. Why is it in there? If, if the sanctuary is an embassy of, of heaven, why does any nationalistic symbol for the flag of any nation in a sanctuary? What happens is, is these pastors come in. They're very motivated. Maybe they're just out of seminary. They're really convicted. They go, they rip it out. They throw the, the flag down the church basement. And then that church member that's been there for, for 60 years comes up to them on a Sunday and says, how dare you? I'm going to re you know, report you to the board, and pretty soon there's a big fight, and the congregation is in turmoil, and people are leaving. Eventually, the pastor exits a few years later, and the first thing that happens is that, that lady comes back, and she moves the flag back into the sanctuary, right? That's not helpful to anybody. So what we said is, like, if that flag is in your sanctuary, let's start having a conversation about why. Let's learn the history of why that flag is there. We tell some of that history in the book. Let's talk about you as a community reflecting on what it's doing there and why do you feel like it's important to be there. Is there another place that maybe it could be that still honors your, the country and honors the flag but isn't in the sacred space of the sanctuary? Let's use that moment. Let's use the Christian nationalism we're perpetuating to have a conversation that makes us a better Christian community. So I would say is start where you are. Be committed to your community and start working on it in your community because that's where you're going to have the most impact. And I think the other benefit of that is as my church and other churches get more and more clear about we are a Christian community, not a Christian nationalistic community, it will create a contrasting witness with some of those churches out there that are very happy to be Christian nationalists. And it will help others see that there is a choice between what that kind of Christian nationalism looks like and what this other Christian witness looks like in a way that I think will ultimately be alluring because at the end of the day, I think Jesus is a pretty compelling guy. And I think the more we can keep the focus on Jesus, the more attractive we're going to be as a church. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Brian, did you have anything that you wanted no. to add to that? Yeah, and then we, we, at the end of the book, as you know, we, we give several steps, and, and, and the flag, taking the flag out isn't the first step, as Bill kind of you know warned, right? Like, there's, there's several steps that conversations that need to be had, and thinking about this, you know, very theologically about how can we look at the own practices in our own churches and denominations, and, you know, one of the things that I think is just most significant is that idea of, well, then, if nationalism distorts the gospel, takes us away from the gospel— then we have to work on, on as pastors or you know, Sunday school teachers or whatever role we have in churches to help broaden the viewpoint, right? To, to become more global minded. And, and that, that's really significant. That's what nationalism tries to, to stop us from doing, right? Nationalism is worried that we will find ourselves in agreement with those on the other side of the border because then when it comes to a time of war, that threatens national sovereignty. It wants you to, to fight for those inside the border as your first and foremost faith and allegiance. 
against those on the other side, those other people. But as Christians, we are in communion with Christians across the border, with Christians throughout time. And that is a theology that begins to shape us and help us to recognize that, you know, we are citizens of two kingdoms, but as Jesus warned us, you can only serve one master. And when, yeah. that, when that point of tension comes, you will prove which one you actually serve. And so we have to do that deep theological work over years of helping detox some of the Americanism out of our churches so that we become Christians first, that we serve uh, and we worship uh, a global God who loves the whole world and that we are, we are in communion with Christians across the whole globe. I love that. So based on all of your research that both of you have done for this book and even beyond, I know that this is just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of the writings and the thinking that you guys have done along these lines and in this theme, what are you like what trends are you seeing in america and you can even expand to globally if you have if you want to but what trends are you seeing and and i know we've been kind of making this case the whole time but again restate for us why is now the urgent time where we need to pay attention to this and where we need to do something about this as christians well, it's and 2024 and all the different things, but especially, year, right? I mean, nothing's <laughs> happening. No, I mean, election year, I mean, it's going to be bad. I mean, right? The it, It's going to be Christian nationalism is going to be more on steroids this year than it was maybe last year. And so I think it's really important that we that we have these conversations because if we're not talking about these issues in our churches, then the only ones who are are those who are using Christianity in the public square for their own partisan benefit. And I, I, we have to, we have to, as Christians, as Christian leaders, to to stand up and to kind of draw some of those lines, because it's it's happening in ways. And I mean, I, I know that you know, Josh and Will, you both know this. You you follow this kind of stuff, but it, our faith is being used to not only support specific candidates, on both sides, uh, com- campaigning mm-hmm. in churches and so forth, and and invoking sacred texts, often out of context to justify their their public policy positions, but then also this blend of Christian nationalism to get us to to have a certain vision of politics, right? To, we're a Christian nation and ergo that means such and such and such and such. We have to keep those other people out, or or, or I guess now we're not even sure if they're people that that are coming into our country, right? And so we are, Mm. you know, that's the danger of Christian nationalism there, literally dehumanizing other people and so it is, it is a really critical time. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better this year. We are seeing a lot of, you know, the quote prophets who are predicting that God has already decided who's going to win, just like they did last time. And whoops, it didn't quite work out that way. That means they're setting the stage for the next insurrection. Because if God has ordained someone to win, and then if the election doesn't turn out that way, well, then we all have, good Christians have to have to rise up to enact God's will and save the nation. I mean, that's religious language that can be really persuasive and also really deadly. And so I'm really concerned at the moment that we find ourselves in. And I think that that this year, so I, I know some pastors may not want to engage in some of the, 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 the difficult and controversial issues but we actually need those voices, not in partisan ways. We're talking about you can do this in deeply theological ways, but we need those kinds of voices of warning this year more than we have even in the recent years. And I would just, I mean, I agree with everything Brian said there, and I would just add that the idea of Christianity is being used to erode democracy in a way that is harming people whom God loves. Mm. And that has to bother us as Christians. And again, the fundamental problem, if you trace it back through that sentence, is that we have forgotten what it means to be Christian. And the people who are using this don't actually know what it means to be Christian. And the church has stopped speaking for itself in a way that seeks to correct um, those those misunderstandings. So the church needs to be the church here. That's That's where this starts, and that's part of why we wrote this book. Yeah, you know, I... I, I really appreciate you you saying that because I think, um, you know, to the outside observer, 
the focus on Christian nationalism can easily be portrayed as very anti-Christian, anti-faith, you know, and and I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, you know, so in the the series, the Heavenly Homeland series, the very last episode um, in the series called The Greatest of These is Love, it's all about sort of like, in, in my mind, and I think probably the broader Christian community's mind, like what Christianity should be about. Um, you know, I was delivered from a very like bad life style before I came to the faith. And I, you know, think that the Bible and Christianity and Jesus can be very, very beautiful. Um, and, yeah. and, um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily out in the streets passing out tracks, but you know, I've had folks come up to me and just ask me about the Bible and stuff. And just, and I just love just sharing it with them because I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful document. I think the person of Jesus is very inspirational. Um, and what I feel about Christian nationalism is it, just sort of, it's tarnishing sort of like the beauty of the faith. And, and I want people to just know Jesus the way I know Jesus. Um, so, so with, to, to your point, Brian, about, you know, 2024 is going to be a crazy year for uh, politics, for Christian nationalism. You know, you've got stuff out there like the, you know, Project 2025, which is like a scary document. Um, so so like as as a voter, like what advice would you give to a voter? And, and th this would be a question for both of you, both of you, you know, whether voters in your congregation, just voters that are believers in general, like how should we approach um, you know, who or what we vote for in the ballot box, um, you know, when we're, when we're, you know, in that ballot box in that sort of private space and we're trying to make a decision on stuff. And I, I, I recognize the sensitivity to what you can or can't say due to sort of your nonprofit status. So feel free to kind of verbal judo it however you, you see fit. Um, and, and Bo, why don't we go with you first? You're setting Brian up for the hard question, then you pass it off to me. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, when I when I talk to people about Christian discipleship, right, all we're trying to do is to follow who Jesus is. And one of the things that I think Jesus really asks us to do is, is to be more empathetic, right? Walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. Like, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Put yourself in somebody else's position and respond to them as if that was you in that position. As you do to the least of these, you do to me, right? See Jesus in those people. So... What I want to do is I want to create a society where everybody can flourish as God intends, and that requires me thinking not just about myself and what I want, but what is best for everybody else and voting accordingly, right? Government, at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is organize our resources and share them in ways that allows for the widest possible flourishing, right? That's kind of what government is. Um, and so when I go into the ballot box, that's what I'm thinking about. How can my vote – have an impact in a way that will allow the most people to flourish as God intends. Yeah, I'm voting uncommitted. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have commitment issues? Oh, yeah. The, uh, no, I mean, I think that one of the biggest things we have to do is try to divorce the idea that, that we are arrogant enough to speak for God, that this is God's candidate and this is God's party uh, in this race. Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to discern values and and character and all of that, but it's 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 a dangerous space to say it's God's will that this person wins. And so I think that's what that's number one, and and be, to be to be very concerned about people who are very confident that they know God's will on that particular space. But I think we are in a place where I, I I've never been a single issue voter and I've never been a, a a straight ticket voter and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, and, and so I think it is really important to evaluate the various candidates. But I also think we are in a place where if someone fundamentally is opposed to basic democracy, like that should be a very strong variable to consider. That should that's the the top line. The question is. Do you want democracy or do you want an authoritarian state? Right? And, and, and I hope people listening to this pod aren't one authoritarianism. But I think that's a really important point. And it doesn't just, by the way, that's not just a party line. We, we have some, some candidates on both sides that are very problematic on, on democratic support. Uh, you know, take uh, Katie Porter's comments after she lost the, the, the primary. I guess it was an open primary, but democratic candidate who lost the, the primary in California. Some very problematic uh, comments that she was using very Trumpian language, you know, to complain that she lost an election, right? And I think I think it, we we've seen the danger of that kind of rhetoric, 
and we need to call out the bad rhetoric and the bad actors wherever they may be and if that means that you look at a ballot and you say none of the above which uh you know yes in the democratic primary you can vote uncommitted in the general election you can't but you you can skip a line if that's what you need to do uh, or you can write someone in depending on your state i mean there, there are ways to be faithful uh, without uh, necessarily you know we the election isn't the end all like this isn't this isn't our ultimate value yeah and I just think that that's what we got to do when we walk into the ballot box. And this year, you know, more so than, than usual. Yeah. So, okay. Um, tell us about the book. Where can people buy it? When is it going to be released? Um, you know, all the logistics, administrative stuff where people can put your book on the New York Times bestseller list. That's the goal. Thank you. Well, we're going to make it now that we're on this pod. So. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you to you all for helping advance that cause. So the book is called <laughs> Baptizing America. How Mainline Protestants Help Build Christian Nationalism. It'll be out this summer from Chalice Press, but you can pre-order it today. You can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all those places where books are sold. But our publisher would prefer, and we'd prefer, that you go to chalicepress.com. And if you go there and use the uh, promo code uh, BA podcast so baptizing america podcast you'll get i think it's 33 percent off the cover price so it should be the cheapest place you can buy it right now and you're buying it straight from our publisher so um we'd love to have you all read it we'd love to hear your feedback to it and we do think it's an important piece of this conversation about christian nationalism that hasn't been said yet and once we if we really want to get at this problem we got to fully understand the problem and we hope that our book will contribute to that that's really good and brian how, how can people follow you and the work that we're in way does yeah thanks yeah, the best way to follow us is at our Substack newsletter, A Public Witness, which is at publicwitness.wordandway.org. We've got some information there about baptizing America in case you, you forget the links or the name of the book, as well as every week more you know, in-depth reporting and analysis at the intersection of faith and politics that delivered straight to your inbox. So. Well, that's really great. Well, guys, uh, thank you so much. Um, if nothing else, it was just good to catch yes. up and see your beautiful faces again. Um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Man, we're young and beautiful. I love you guys. No wonder we yes. all want to come young, on here. Young, you know, beautiful, uh, and vibrant. The host, you have to know how to rub your guests the right way. So um, hopefully my mission has been accomplished. Uh, but thank you so much for everything you, you folks are doing. Great book, Blazing. Uh, please, I was about to say Blazing America because I said <laughs> <laughs> Baptizing America. Uh, <laughs> Make sure you all pick it up. And uh, thank you uh, to our, our uh, audience. And remember, keep your conversations not right or left, but up. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Thanks, friends.